Welcome, listeners of Bread and Thread and Probably Bad, to a very special crossover episode. Dean Daniel here. Thanks to Hedwig, Carlo, and the Socialist Hobgoblin for their continued support. In my feud with Tabletop Tim, the imposter announcer of the podcast. I've got my revenge on him, though. I've sawn the legs of his tables. So when he tries to do anything with them, like, say, play a game, the dice will go all wrong. <laughs> He'll never see it coming. Hello, and welcome to the Probably Bad Podcast, a podcast which is definitely bad. I'm Pencil. I'm Paper. And today it is also Bread and Thread. My two podcasts have combined into a glorious beast. So I am also Liz. And I am Hazel. I'm I'm here from Bread and Thread. Um and now I'm on another podcast. So soon I shall take over the podcast world. I um, have no name on Bread and Thread, so no one refer to me. <laughs> so Actually that's a good point. Are we are we referring to you by your name on on bread and thread, or uh, am I saying paper, uh, pencil? Refer to me by whatever series of like sounds you prefer. Okay. Okay. If we just make a nonsense noise, you'll assume it's you. Yes. So, we we have combined these two podcasts because it's time for a book-based bread and thread. And Wizards of the Coast gave me a wonderful birthday present last year by bringing out. A D and D cookbook. It it legit came out on my birthday. Oh wow! <laughs> <laughs> they were definitely thinking of you. I mean, it it's a probably bad cookbook. It's probably bad. I've I've read through the whole thing and I have some thoughts. <laughs> so yeah. So full disclaimer: I don't eat food, so um, I'm not sure how useful I'll be, but I'll interject with intermittent points. And we'll, we'll describe like the experience of um, physically eating something. Yeah, uh, I sustain myself entirely off um, likes on my social media. Valid. We blog or I'll die. So I've had a, I have <laughs> had like a very quick look at this cookbook, and it seems very well produced. Um, like it's it's got some pretty pictures in it. It, it's definitely it looks good like i think you, you can tell that it's properly by wizards of the coast and you can tell that the people who wrote it are quite successful fantasy authors but you can also tell the people that wrote it are quite successful fantasy authors in how the recipes are written okay like just very basic things that I would expect from a cookbook, like total cooking times or maybe what the food will look like, just <laughs> aren't there. They have made cooking. I think only about a third of the recipes have pictures, and some of them, because they all have fantasy names, I don't know what this is. Okay, that that is a certain thing I've noticed. Yeah, like because it is. A Dungeons and Dragons cookbook. You have to get the Dungeons and Dragons flavor in. So a lot of the recipes seem to be like <laughs> kind of real world recipes, but but with the name of a place in the Dungeons and Dragons lore yeah. like tacked on to the beginning. Mm. A lot of the ingredients too, which is somewhat unhelpful. <laughs> well, so there's one that is um, dragon salmon, which is just a very basically cooked salmon fillet but okay. there's no there's no serving suggestion or anything it's just here's a way to cook a lump of salmon am i supposed yeah, that to is serve how dragons it? make salmon I, yeah is it, am i supposed to serve it to a dragon or am i making it from a dragon i that's unclear the idea that dragons taste like salmon what do dragons taste like what are you asking as if one of us will know the answer my well, assumption will be something like goose. 
Because if lizards taste like chicken, dragons are probably gamier. Okay, that makes sense because they're like a raptor, right? So mm. tastes like some kind of bird. Yeah. I feel like, I don't know, like they're lots of like elemental things. So I kind of feel like it might just taste like you're eating mud, which would be sad. Oh. Maybe they just taste like whatever fire tastes like. What? So, like, like spice, spicy pheasant is what I'm getting from this. Well, yeah, I don't know. Like, spice- like, maybe fire has a flavour that we can't experience because we would burn our tongues, and the only way we can experience it is by eating a red dragon. Yeah, um, the message we're not getting is, fire is delicious, try and eat it. But also, if you do eat fire, please don't blame us. Nothing on this podcast is, is legally liable. Hmm. Yeah, they, I do find it interesting. Like the, like there's a lot of law for each recipe, but there doesn't seem to be anything like particularly interesting. It's mostly just a lot of name drops, mm. or like here's a fun reference to a second edition source book. Like, like it sort of has the feeling cool. of like it should be part of the source book that doesn't exist. If you know what I mean. Hmm. Like can I it, can I read the first paragraph of the introduction? Because absolutely, I, I like it. Okay, what is Dungeons and Dragons? For some, it's a dynamic narrative game with infinite possibilities. For others, an exciting tactical contest of strategy and wit. But for many, it is far more than a game. It's a way of life. Oh gosh, it goes on. If you're holding this book, then you probably love two things, D&D and sharing a great meal. <laughs> Which, to be fair, I think they're probably right. They found their audience, you have to give them that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, given that a lot of people play D&D over pizza or something, um, they, they have got a, a pretty good niche here. Like, There's definitely a D&D cookbook market. I mean, they they do then take about 40 pages to get to the actual recipes, but points for trying. (laughs) Yeah, this introduction is like short and hilarious and great. And then like there's also like pages and pages of exposition. (laughs) Which again, like isn't anything new law wise. It's just like, hey, did you know adventurers go to places that have food and sometimes the food is nice? But for 40 pages. There's also just like a load of scene setting photos. Mm. Yeah. Which, I mean, they're cool photos, but there is quite a lot of them. <laughs> like, what, I'm just looking at one now that is, it's just a knife stuck into a table. Like, one of the things I had. <laughs> yeah, it's like absolutely no disrespect to, like, Emma Campion, the director of the, photo- of the photos which I assume means the person in charge of the photos. But it's, it's, it doesn't scream recipe book to me. <laughs> like, there's a bit in it where it goes through different, um, different settings and what food they have. But it doesn't go into, like, any real detail. Like, a lot of them just have the food of the place they're inspired by. Um, it doesn't go into Aethos or Ravenloft at all, other than mentioning they exist. Um, which they don't, incidentally. Uh, I checked their fantasy worlds. Um, <laughs> then it, like... Yeah, like, a lot of it is just... This place has food like traditional medieval European foods, which I'm sure you're surprised by, given that it's um, basically medieval Europe with werewolves. Yeah, I did notice that, especially in in the human section. So there's there's chapters split up by different like D and D races, um, or at least some of them. There's humans, elves, dwarves, halflings, and then other, which includes stuff like apparently lizard folk are really into chicken tenders. Um, but the the human section is basically here's a bunch of European recipes, and also a stir fry because. We're going to pretend we remembered that all humans aren't European. Yeah, 
Like, I don't like that all humans are basically medieval Europe. And, like, it's not even good versions of the stuff. Like, the gingerbread recipe doesn't even have syrup in. It sounds incredibly dry and kind of one note in terms of flavours, honestly. And there's a stew for six people, which is seasoned with a teaspoon of paprika. Like, humans in D&D are both European and don't know how to cook. To be fair, does check out. <laughs> hey, so I'm yeah. the The first recipe that is in this book uh, is iron rations, which is supposed to be um, like journey food that you take with you, like your rations. And <laughs> the recipe is just. I mean, it's all just like cured meats and cheese and like dried fruits and things and crackers um that's it the directions for this recipe are just put the in ingredients on plates and serve them <laughs> so <laughs> yeah i i feel like this is kind of slightly redundant. so again i i don't eat food um but like a lot of the meals do seem very simplistic Mm. Like I, I think I particularly enjoy the iron rations though, just because they have a little note at the end that's just, if you actually want to travel with this recipe, change it or it'll go all soggy. <laughs> so like, it's not even a good rations recipe; it's just charcuterie. <laughs> I mean, to be fair, all those things do sound quite nice, but none of them are things that you make. They're, they're just food. Just just buy food. <laughs> hmm. Yes, in their defense, just buy food is the like simplest recipe to put in a cookbook. Step one, pick up phone. Step two, call takeaway. Ah, but which takeaway? Ah, decisions. But like the ingredients, even in some of these stuff, like. There's one that uses a brand name of peppers rather than saying what kind of peppers it is. I had to look up what it meant. Okay. Um, and there's also a venison roast where the first ingredient is beef. There is no venison in this venison roast. Which I, I have been informed by some Americans I played D&D with that venison is not that hard to get over there. So I don't know why uh. they went with beef. Huh. I would think with like having a lot of you know large national parks and hunting being popular, you could you could just get venison? No, you must use beef for your venison roast. Okay. Yes. I mean, you could even just say use this much of venison or beef if you can't get it. Mm. But no. Can I can I read you out the list of so I I went through the dwarven section because I knew that was going to be interesting with okay. the with like the way that D and D does dwarves. I I just want to read out the real world equivalents of the various dwarven recipes: bangers and mash, Swedish meatballs, shepherd's pie, bleak and potato soup, all. What I would expect: sausage and sauerkraut, porridge, and duck a l'orange. Just, just throw that in there at the end. Okay, What's so the, the invented by dwarves. <laughs> the dwarves have only two settings: like German peasant food and duck a l'orange. <laughs> Apparently, <laughs> like maybe what? that's what they make for guests. I guess. But I mean, the like, elves also have eaten mess, which is called meal end, because you have it at the end of the meal, because <laughs> great world building, guys. So I, so I, feel like every, I feel like every race just has one recipe that's completely out of place. Maybe. Maybe it's like the thing where, you know, your country has a national dish, but it's not really something that people actually eat. 
Yeah. I love the idea of duck a rons being like the weird traditional food your granny makes, but no one really likes it. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, like I like the idea of like, you know, I'm a bit torn on whether or not it could be this is what you'd expect the species to have versus here's some world building of why these species might eat things other than what you expect them to eat. But it doesn't really do either. Mm. Like, as you said, it's sort of like, like, if it was like, okay, so here's why Duck Alarange is eaten by dwarves for whatever reason. I don't fucking know why they would do, but they do. And that could be some interesting world building stuff. The Dwarf King's but... mother was killed by ducks when he was a child. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And uh, the founder of Dwarf Society was pushed over a cliff by three ducks. And ever since then, they have sworn revenge on all ducks by <laughs> cooking them with orange. Yeah, like the the entirety of the flavor text for for this recipe, which is orange mountain duck, is basically maybe being near humans made them like oranges. Okay, do humans <laughs> particularly like oranges? Oranges don't come up in the human section. They come up in the orange section where you cook bacon in orange juice. Gee, I, I like the idea of the orcs having stolen all of the oranges. <laughs> that is a level one rod shot right there. Sorry, I'm getting weirdly yeah. passionate about hating on this book. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I mean, to be fair, some of some of the recipes do sound quite nice. Um, mm. it's, it's just that they're not particularly... They just don't really scream fantasy to me, I guess. Mm. Like, you are a human, like, it's a human dwarf meeting, and you're going to serve traditional duck a la ronde, which is the human dwarf food, but orcs have stolen all of the oranges, and now you need to get it back in a cook-off with the orc warlord who is also, like, a five-star Michelin chef. I mean, we, we have achieved what well, every episode of Probably Bad achieves in coming up with something I want to play. And, like, yeah, you need to go on a quest to find all of the, like, rare ingredients. And you also need to go on a quest to find a better cookbook than the Hero's Beast book that you have. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, like, this orc tribe um, are famous for their culinary skills. Um, they run a series of high-class restaurants. Uh, instead of, like, attacking towns and pillaging them, they attack towns and gentrify them by setting up their high-class restaurants and attracting in various, like, wealthy bugbears and goblins and hobgoblins and so forth who then starts, like, gentrifying the area. Oh, no. Um, I just feel very strongly that orcs should be metaphors for the bourgeoisie. Like, <laughs> if you're going to have imperialistic an imperialistic raiding species that goes around violently enforcing its wills on other races and taking from them you don't make them a metaphor for whatever like primitive group you don't like you make them a metaphor for the bourgeoisie orcs should be wearing suits and monocles and top hats and coming in and setting up high class restaurants i don't remember what we're reviewing what i'm reviewing is my <laughs> dislike that orcs could be a really good metaphor for colonialism if people put them on the right side of the colonialist divide. Uh, see, and then instead of like having a campaign where we go adventuring and, and like beat up goblins in dungeons, we could have a campaign where we sort of sit around the table and discuss um, the, the kind of ethics of the nature of food and like how certain recipes that are popular among the working class get sort of taken and yeah. and used in fancy restaurants as this really fancy thing and like what that means for us all. So hmm. what you're saying is we need to expand on the one shot that I ran that both of you were in where you ended up introducing a bunch of halfling navvies to the concept of collective bargaining. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, in case yeah. you're wondering, yeah. all of our RPGs eventually turn into bourgeois versus the proletariat. There was uh, that game. We do. <laughs> there was that game where we invented trade unionism. <laughs> uh, workers of the world unite, you have nothing to do with the 
we've got to change. This is a joke, Jeff Bezos. Please don't cancel our podcast. Workers of the world unite. You have nothing to lose but your duck a la ranch. <laughs> <laughs> no more recipes then. So yeah, I'm looking right now at Green Spear Bundles in Bacon, which is in the Elven section. Um which is in fact is asparagus wrapped in bacon. That that's it. Um and baked. Which, you know, again, quite nice. Asparagus and bacon go quite well together. It's more that the the flavour text, as you put it, which is I really like that term, especially for a cookbook. <laughs> um yeah the explanation for why this is a thing which i i don't think this one would really need too much explanation like this is asparagus and bacon but they've gone for the take that um elves just eat asparagus raw uh, or green spear as they call it in D world um but half elves have uh as they put it in an irreverent touch, but one that flavorfully complements the green spear, half elves added salted and cured pork into the mix in deference to their half human taste buds. So. Ah, uh, yes, because elves are vegetarian. Uh, uh-huh. So, yeah, apparently half elves, um, like, apparently ruined this uh, sacred elven vegetable with bacon. We have no idea that, like, asparagus is a sacred elven vegetable. But, like,. <laughs> I also like the idea of everything in D&D getting ridiculous fantasy names. It's not asparagus, it's green spear. Yeah, the, the elf section is interesting because I feel like they, they ran out of like good vegetarian meal ideas pretty quickly. So you have one that's just mashed butternut squash. That's the dish. I found dragon salmon. <laughs> it, it's called high harvest puree. But it's it's just mashed butternut squash. It's I I don't know at this point, you guys. Any else eat fish? So I was a pescatarians. Mm. Mm. <laughs> I could probably serve the salmon with the mashed butternut squash, but I would call them together a dish separately. It's just here's uh, how to cook two things. Actually, this is in fact just a slab of salmon. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> Why is it dragon salmon? Has it got chili in it? I think dragon salmon is is a species. Okay. In in one yeah, of the D and D worlds. Uh, da, 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 da. there is no um, fluff tech. Well, there is fluff tech, but like it's just this is salmon. Yeah, I, I think dragon salmon shows up in a source book as just like yeah. a really big salmon. Yeah, it seems like yeah, it's just a very big fish. It sounds like it should be one of those um, Victorian mock foods, you know, like mock turtle mm. soup, dragon salmon. Ooh. So is that salmon made to taste like dragon or dragon made to taste like salmon? Again, we're, we're back to the eternal question. <laughs> <laughs> salmon that just tastes like fire without the pain. Okay, I'm, I'm looking at the dwarf cuisine. Like again, is... the, the dwarf stuff like is stuff that sounds quite nice and warming, but one of them is just bangers and mash. Dwarfs famously don't eat sweets, apparently. Ooh, a common misconception about dwarves is that they lack adventurous culinary spirit or imagination. But in fact, they have highly sensitive taste buds, often overwhelmed by bright piquant or saccharine flavors. They prefer their soups dense. <laughs> I, was, I, I really love the idea that dwarves prefer plain food because pretty much all of D&D Tumblr has agreed that dwarves have really spicy food because they can handle poisons better than everyone else. Mm. So then opening this and it just being like, dwarves don't like seasoning is really weird to me. I... I... Just, I like the choice of words as well. Like, the, they prefer their soups dense is just making me think of, like, just dwarves want a really dumb soup. Like, I want my soup to have failed, it's 11+. plus. Oh, you're right, only... there is bangers and mash, but it's called bangers and spell smash soup. Because they're dwarves. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. 
<laughs> Which is great because Smash is a brand of instant mashed potato, but the writers probably didn't know that. I, I do love the idea, though, that dwarves wouldn't call it mash. They need a slightly more violent word. Everything that appears on a dwarven table has been mauled in some way or other. <laughs> of course, I am now just imagining the Hulk in a kitchen. I feel that is the ultimate mash. conclusion of all probably bad RPG ideas. But that that's just me. The Hulk is in a kitchen run by the... Um... Imperialist orcs. <laughs> they saw how big he was and went, yes, he must be the greatest of us all. I like we live in like where yeah, we decide who's the chef based on who's tallest. <laughs> so they can reach the top shelves. Yeah, that's where they keep all the good food. <laughs> I, I do also enjoy dwarves don't like have, don't like seasoned food, and then one of the recipes has cumin and cayenne and tahini. Not paprika. It's not seasoning. Like there's there is no consistency to dwarven cuisine. Okay, yeah, orange mountain duck. Hmm. Like, again, the food doesn't sound bad, it just, it seems like just a cookbook of completely random recipes with the names of dwarves put on them. And I guess, to be fair, they can't put in actual magical food. Although, that, but, that would be quite a good take, actually, if it was all, like, the most ridiculous fantasy magical food, but then the ingredients were like, oh, well, if you can't get, like, sparkling blue moon mushrooms, then you could just use... Uh, Chanterelles. I mean, they they do make an attempt at that in exactly one of the dwarven recipes, where they're like, if you can't source authentic underdark vegetables, use radishes. <laughs> I like that. It's just a, a sentence in itself, I think. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's the, the high fantasy, like, contrasted with the mundane, like, it's just radishes, man. <laughs> Mm. Special darkness radishes. <laughs> yeah, no, it's just the the way that the recipes have just kind of been shoehorned into the fantasy setting, I think, that is the makes it a bit of a letdown. Yeah. Again, none of the three named authors are the the food person. Who's apparently like an actual chef who's been on TV in, in the States and stuff called Adam Reed. Okay. And is not mentioned anywhere in the book except on the copyright page as the recipe developer. It's like, I feel kind of bad for him, but also develop some better recipes. Like, oh. one of the things in the dwarven section is called black pudding, presumably after the monster, except it's a chocolate pudding and it makes my Lancastrian heart hurt. Oh no. Like, it sounds nice, but it's not black pudding. <laughs> Do you think uh, Barry can get out of copyright on that? <laughs> Although I do appreciate that it's at least, it's one of the things where there's a picture and it's in a metal bowl with some rune stones next to it, so you know it's fantasy. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, I've just got to the black pudding recipe. It It is just chocolate soup, apparently. And then, again, with the completely oh. ignoring the fantasy part in the ingredients, you want Dutch processed cocoa powder, which okay. we actually talked about in our chocolate episode, but yes. also, like, maybe don't specify a real country if you're doing a fantasy thing. Just put cocoa powder. That's a good point. In <laughs> Where in the D&D &D realms is Holland? <laughs> I don't know, but apparently D and D stands for dwarves and Dutchmen. <laughs> like, although to be fair, uh, the first, like the second edition Monster Manual did canonically decide some creatures as coming from India. Did it? So, apparently, we, yeah, um, yeah, some of the themes were described as coming from India, which is a whole thing. So, right, 
But yeah, no, just canonically mentioned, India has a place that exists wow. in the indie world in the second edition Monster Manual. So there you go. India and Holland, those are the two co- real world countries that exist canonically. This is like some Narnia world. stuff, where it's just like if you walk far enough towards Holland, you hit Faerun, apparently. Is there just a portal somewhere in the Forgotten Realms that leads directly to the kitchen of a corner restaurant in Rotterdam? <laughs> Yes, now I have to Can't decided. prove there isn't. <laughs> we have like the idea of a portal to like the real world, but it's just in a really like mediocre location. Can we talk about the first recipe in the halfling I... section? Sure. Well, uh, I no. You. So it's it's fondue, but they don't call it fondue. Oh, I've just found it. <laughs> Would you like to read out the name? Community Cheeses. I don't want your community <laughs> oh, no. cheese. Cheese is not a community. Cheese is individual. I don't know what that's a meta I don't know what that's a euphemism for, but I know I don't like it. Oh gosh, a cauldron of community cheeses on the table for all to enjoy. How many people are dipping into this fondue pot? It wouldn't be a half jamboree without a cauldron of community cheeses on the table. And that's how all the halflings got typhoid. <laughs> I mean, the, the choice of the word jabberie is its own <laughs> separate issue, I feel. Each bite is sweet with a surprising new taste combination. This fondue is perfect for dagger dipping. You'd just be sure to please the blood off. What is dagger dipping? I was, yeah, I was thinking, like, I do actually quite like the idea of fondue, where you're you are only served it with a dagger and you just like stab things into the cheese. Don't dip your dagger in my community cheese. Yes. <laughs> I won't. Unless. <laughs> no, nah, I'm joking. <laughs> Unless. Uh-huh, like joking. the halfling Unless. section really goes into it with the whole like, we're going to name stuff other things. Like, we have, um, it's not a grilled cheese, it's melted cheeses. Or perhaps if you fancy something sweeter, would you like some sweet nibbles? I'd like some sweet nibbles. Halfling, halfling cuisine is bizarre. Oh my goodness, important. okay, there's chicken something dumplings. Apparently there is a mysterious ingredient. Except also, this is a recipe book, so we have all the ingredients. Yeah. So I, I don't know which of these ingredients is the something, because none of them are particularly, like, unusual. I'm trying to figure it out, and there's nothing in here that's like, oh, that's a, a completely, like, um, you know, I never thought that would go with it, but it does. Um, yeah, like, I probably wouldn't put sherry in a chicken stew myself. But I don't think it counts as, oh, this is a really weird ingredient. This is something. Yeah, it's just vegetables. Oh. Pigs in bed rolls. Is that pigs in blankets? That's adorable. Okay. I, I believe so, yes. <laughs> yes, it is pigs in blankets. Anyway. Oh. Few things put a spring in a half thing step, quite like the buttery sausage set. It's just a sausage roll. Pigs in bed rolls. The buttery sausage scent. <laughs> it's not even like a good sausage roll. It's hot dogs wrapped in puff paste. No, you can't make a sausage roll with a hot dog. Uh, I think you're fine if you look at this. They're making sausage rolls. No, they're dogs. making hogs in bed rolls. <laughs> yes. I like that, like, one of the ingredients is frozen pastry that's been thawed. Like, you you can't you can't buy just the refrigerated ready made pastry. You have to buy the frozen kind, and then oh, unfreeze yeah, that, it. You can't use it frozen. Half things are cheesy boys. Horny cheesy boys. Horny cheesy boys. Hey, hold on a sec. I apologize if you blend for that. it into that's not a broth. It's a soup. Yeah, broth is pretty much explicitly like. I made this with yeah, bones. Yeah, broth is like watery. So, um, so just going a bit further on, um, 
There is a low wood salad. Uh, it, it's a salad. Um, but its flavor text just casually mentions, oh yes, also everyone here is dead. But what? Uh, prior to... Uh, so it's from the place of the fort, N nation of Lurian. Da, 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 da. Prior to the spell plague, which, spell plague which submerged all of Lurian, this sweet and savory salad. I don't weirdly like the um, like the power move of just yeah. Uh, if you want to know more about this meal, you can't. Everyone involved in it died, but but it's got pecans and spring cheese. Right, like yeah, it was really popular in this region that was entirely submerged by a terrible plague. <laughs> well, I guess I'll just imagine that. <laughs> Yeah, like, I know we keep saying it, but the attempts to work in world building, except not, not again, not really world building so much as, like, name dropping stuff that someone else already came up with. It's just Apple so and Blackberry Pie ha has a mythic origin, which is just a halfling had apples <laughs> and blackberries and made them into a pie. I mean, that does sound like a halfling <laughs> myth, to be fair. Yeah, um <laughs> That's fantastic. I I am in awe of it. It's the very legendary. I mean apple and blackberry pie is delicious. Oh, yeah. oh that looks like a nice pie. Ooh, uncommon cuisine. Yeah. So again, I, I play D and D with some people from the southern US. And they, they had some opinions about Arkham the Cruel's flame roasted halfling chili. Hold on. Which. Okay, so Arkham the Cruel is a. like, actual DD character um, who works for Tiamat, the evil dragon. And apparently this book has his chili recipe, which is not particularly spicy and also made with turkey mince rather than beef. So yeah, are we, are we just not going to talk about the fact that this is made of halfling in universe? <laughs> and also that halflings taste of turkey. It has the evilest um, recipe ingredient, where it has a Vecna's handful of cocoa powder. Also, Vecna has very small hands. Have... It's one and a half tablespoons. <laughs> Vecna's famously tiny hands. Oh my goodness. Oh, oh so, sorry, I'm just going back through things. Tieflings. Um... Either eat uh da, 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 very um spicy foods, or if they're less uh if they're more in touch with their demon inclinations, then they eat um raw meat. And I weirdly like the idea that the more demonic you are, the less you cook things. I guess if you get to a certain level of demonic, you can just use your your own, own internal fire to cook the meat. Oops. Also, I like that the orc um, bacon has orc in uh, quotation marks. Also, incidentally, um, canonically, if you're being chased by orcs, you can leave bacon behind, so you stop and eat the bacon so you can escape. It's like throwing rice at vampires. Orcs are mandated to eat any bacon they come across, regardless of context. Okay, yeah. I, like, I would just like to give a shout out to the best um fantasy like popular series cookbook that that i have ever read which i do in fact own which is the red wall cookbook it is excellent um like it it's written for children but also the like the recipes are nice and it is in fact written by brian jakes i do not know if he wrote the recipes but um there's like a whole entire story about how they're preparing this feast and like the recipes are part of the story and it's so cute. Yeah. It's, I, 
See, that, that seems like a much better way of doing it. Like, you either do that or you go, like, this book exists in universe, like the Nanny Ogg's cookbook from Discord. Oh, I have not read that one. Is that good? It's, there's a lot of stuff in it that I really want to make, and it's, it's really fun, and it is it is written as if Nanny Og wrote it. That's a good idea, because then you can just basically get away with anything by yeah, saying, um, like, this is what the character wrote. But instead, we have this. Yeah, the character is... That World of Darkness um, cookbook, A, exists for some bizarre reason, and B, is also actually quite good. Um... The premise is different supernaturally things giving their um, different meals. And luckily it does have the advantage that everything has to exist in universe rather than giving it a weird fantasy like label. So that's another like surprising thing. So we've established that the problem with this book isn't that it's based on a fantasy property and isn't that it's based on a TTRPG. Because those have been successfully done. Yeah, I feel like it's if there's enough kind of focus on food in the original media, then a cookbook is probably going to work quite well. Um, and I, I think this dish, sorry, this dish is as sweet and as smooth as a tall glass of mm. owlbear milk. I have no reference for that. So it's something that everyone <laughs> reading the book can relate to. <laughs> I mean, I suppose anyway, you're saying. That, that definitely is, like, a D&D cookbook is a good idea because there is a lot, like, everyone has, with their D&D party, like, gone to a tavern and then, like, spent about half an hour ordering food instead of actually talking mm. about the plot. And I mean, it is named after a spell which Not. a lot of people do sit down and go, okay, so what's everyone having? You can have anything. <laughs> and you get these big discussions about like their character's favourite foods, which is really yeah. fun. I feel like what we should do is Hero's Feast, but you have to choose one of the meals in this book. <laughs> and it has to be Community <laughs> Jesus. It just always summons the community <laughs> cheeses. You could combine the community cheeses with the iron rations and then just like have cheese and salami because like you're halfway to a pizza at that point. Surprised there isn't a pizza recipe in it. Like Hero's Feast and it summons a pizza but it only summons like each bit of the pizza separately and you have well, to combine this them. This book has flatbread, it has melted cheese, it has cold cuts. It doesn't have a tomato sauce, but one of the things is served with ketchup, so I'm counting it. You could hear us feast up a pizza. I love that idea, like with just a palavant. giant pizza. <laughs> we we need we need to gird ourselves for the coming boss battle. I'll order a twenty inch pizza. The idea that pizza can be delivered. I know it's a spell, but like I'm imagining a delivery person just strolling into the depths of the deepest dungeon, just with like, well, oh, it was quite tricky to get here. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's still got it in less than 30 minutes. Bit hidden away, this place, isn't it? There's a one shot idea. <laughs> You are a party of pizza You're delivery a pizza delivery guy. <laughs> you have received to bring a giant pizza and... to the center of the dungeon. Yeah. That's your main quest. You have to fight your way through the dungeon to deliver a pizza. I notice we've been going for like nearly an hour now. I mean, we just there is a lot, a lot to, to talk, talk about. about in this there book. is a lot to discuss. Like, I'm still not over lizard folk chicken tenders. <laughs> lizard folk love their chicken tendies. Can, so, considering we have been going for so long, can we move on to the drinks section? Oh, yes, please. Um, or should I say yes. elixirs and ales? The, there is no recipe for ale in this. Oh. Um, 
Are there recipes for elixirs? There, there is a recipe for a cocktail which includes just like blending some jam into your mocktail. Okay. I'm I'm trying to refine it now. It's like there's some good stuff. There's like a malt cider cider and there's like a mint absinthe thing and a coffee hot chocolate. And then there's also jam drink. Um blend up some jam spices and honey in some water and call it evermead. Like putting honey in does not make okay. it mead, my dudes. <laughs> Actually, anything you're putting in is mead, a beehive is mead. Does that make me mead? Mm hmm. Nice. Yes. Like, there are some genuinely good good ones, but yeah, there's the jam mocktail and there's a spinach and blueberry smoothie. Oh, gosh. Okay. I, I know green smoothies are meant to be good for you, but also, I've never been persuaded to drink. We've also got dwarves and their oranges again. They've got um, mulled wine. Dwarf and mulled wine with oranges. It really in. sounds like dwarves are the ones that like oranges in this universe. Maybe maybe the orcs just stole the oranges like, from the dwarves and put it on their bacon and we're like, <laughs> some some anthropologist putting together this book is like, what are you eating? It's like, orange bacon. <laughs> Write it down. I'd like... I like the idea in this universe, oranges originated underground. <laughs> They're brightly coloured so you can see them in the dark. The cave, famous cave oranges. Yeah. I, I need you both to know I'm now putting Until cave the... oranges in my D&D setting. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Your quest is to stop the orcs um, stealing the cave oranges. And then, like, making them into some, like, crappy mass produced. Um, that they will serve in their fancy gentrifying thing. restaurants. Yeah. Yeah. Like, there are some interesting sounding cocktails in here. Like, there's one called the Mind Flayer, Ooh. which is like um, ginger, lime, grape juice, and vodka, which sounds quite okay. interesting. Mind Flayer is a great name for a cocktail. It is. It's. I mean, the the description kind of reminds me of a pangalactic gargle blaster. <laughs> like it, it's purple and citrusy and makes your brain feel funny. <laughs> and it's got ice in it. It's a pangalactic gargle ah, blaster. Wonder if it feels like being hit by a golden brick. Like I I don't drink, but I imagine that uh, that it would be nice. Hmm. And like the potion of restoration sounds really nice as well. It's like it's mostly blackberries and lemon, and then you put in some gin and some um, blackberry liqueur. Ooh, that sounds good. Which again, I don't drink, but it sounds delicious. Yeah, that would restore me. But then my brain just goes. But there's also a jam cocktail. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well. I think you should try the jam cocktail. For reasons. I, I would, but I also value my sense of taste. <laughs> that was like you problem. enough to drink jam. <laughs> <laughs> Every time you get a natural one, paper does have a jar of jam. It's true. Please stop rolling once. It hurts. <laughs> but yeah, then after the drinks, you get into like general advice for cooking food for your D and D group. One of the actual pieces of advice is establish in advance whether you'll be eating before or after the game. Like, yeah, yeah, that's how the, that's how meal planning works. That makes sense. Don't just wait for your players to walk in and then hold them down and <laughs> feed them your community cheese. Just, just halfway bad. through the game, stick some jam in the blender and don't explain. <laughs> it'll, it'll add flavour to the game. <laughs> to be fair, like, if you're playing like a kind of more surreal game, if you're just sat there blending jam for the entire time you're jamming, that is going to add some flavour to me. Like, just... 
every time the players wait, like every time the players like you know roll an extra one, you just sort of look solemn, take out the blender, take out a jar of jab of blender. If you are the dungeon master, it might be best to leave the cooking to someone else. I mean, yeah, like, you probably can't DM while cooking a three-course meal. I mean, maybe you can. You don't want to have to... You don't want to have to, have to fish a D4 out of your community cheeses. But would you dagger dip it? I would. <laughs> Don't dagger dip your D four. I, I do also like that rule three is the the rules are guidelines. Like, yeah, because you haven't really given me full recipes. Hmm. For example, you could assign tofu, chicken, pork, and beef each on number to a D four, and whichever it lands ends up being uh, in your meal. I mean, that sounds fun, but also like. Some sources go well with some of those and not others. I kind of do want to try making a recipe entirely by dice roll. That sounds awful. I love it. Uh, I need. I can't believe how long this is going on. Yeah, they do actually. Um, <laughs> there's, there's like a postscript where they thank like everyone involved in D and D over the years. They thank Wizards of the Coast, like all of the designers, the writers, like the the people who made the book, the people who are involved. They don't thank the chef. Yeah, the, the poor guy could, like yeah. wrote all of these recipes. There's quite a lot of recipes, honestly. Uh, like they're very they're very basic. But if if you if this is like your first cookbook, you could do worse. And they they don't. Like I said, he isn't mentioned beyond the copyright page. They're just like, oh, we'd like to thank everybody who made this book possible, and the chef is not one of them, apparently. It's like they thank the publicity manager. Yeah. But not the the guy that made the recipes. Aw. I thank you. Who who was it again? I do thank you. They do thank the chef, don't they? This is not to forget the incredible recipe developer and chef responsible for making such a delicious reality that's just the purpose here. Our infinite thanks to Adam Okay, Reed. it's just it's just hidden away. Which to be fair is admittedly several oh, yeah, paragraphs. They, they thank in him after the... they thank like Chris Perkins and Mike Mills and and like just D and D people. Yeah. It does sort of seem like they might have forgot the incredible recipe developer and chef responsible. Yeah, like he he's thanked in like basically the same breath as like the Dwarven Forge guy, who basically just gave them some stuff to take pictures of. He's he's in the special thanks section, not the like people that actually made the book th oh, section. There we go. Special thanks. Mm. Oh yeah, they thank like special thanks to like about 10 people and then the chef he has one sentence oh i see okay so they apparently compiled and conceptualized the dishes and then he had to make them into recipes i love that so they basically went hey what if we had fondue and then adam <laughs> reed had to figure out how to make some half fondue. fondue but can you make it fantasy fondue but can you make the names <laughs> Slightly <laughs> I just I I feel bad for Adam Reed. A petition to have a second D and D cookbook where Adam Reed Adam. has full creative right. like freedom. Well, especially because like after all of the thanks, the the three authors get their own little section, <laughs> yeah. and he he just gets half a sentence after the. Like in the special thanks. It's not fair. You totally missed an opportunity to have a picture of Adam Reed. I don't know what he looks like, but have him dressed up in like completely outlandish fantasy armor with just a tiny chef's hat on top. That would make me hmm. approximately 80% more miss... likely to buy a cookbook. Adam Reed, if you're listening to this, thank you. You did a great job. I'm sorry we were mean to your recipes. <laughs> but in our defense. But it's mostly the presentation that's the yeah. problem. 
Um, so yeah, thank thank you for listening to the crossover episode. Um, and now friends. If, if you like pencil more, you can go to patreon.com slash probably bad RPG ideas. And if you like hazel more, you can go to patreon.com slash bread and thread. Thanks on you though, because it's all under choose. the probably bad umbrella. It is. It's all. It's all pencil paper production. It is the pencil paper podcast empire. Yeah. By empire, we mean two uh, podcasts. Hazel is. Yeah, uh, Hazel is disposable. Hey, no listen, offenses. you cannot replace my knowledge of obscure Viking textile methods. Um, but yeah, we we hope you enjoyed this this special episode we will see you next time and remember to have a probably bad day and eat your community cheeses probably bad bread and bread eat your community cheeses